Welcome to another moment in the Word. Stephen is the first Christian martyr. We've often maybe asked ourselves, will I be faithful in the end? Will I have the grace to be able to be faithful, to give witness to him, to not cower, to be one that focuses on Jesus? Well, what did Stephen focus on? Where were his eyes? What was his heart? What was going through his mind? You know, that's what we see in the passage we're looking at. It is that Stephen has given a very lengthy message to the Sanhedrin, standing before them who are seated in a semicircle around him, and they are reacting, and their reaction is very strong. And Stephen's response is even stronger. Here's what we see. We're in Acts chapter 7, and we're looking at verses 54 down to verse 56. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, being filled with the Holy Spirit, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God, and said, Behold, I see the heavens opened, and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. The very first word is the word heard. When they heard, they, as the Sanhedrin, these 72 men, they heard these, and it's in a participle. It is where they continued to hear. They heard without any interruption. The Holy Spirit had restrained them so that they could not object, at least outwardly. And they heard what? They heard these things. What things? Well, actually, they heard that there were seven accusations that Stephen had made. If we look at verse 51, the first one is, he said, you're stiff-necked. You're like an ox that won't, re won't turn to the right or the left. You are recalcitrant. You're refusing to accept any thought or way but your own. And the second is, you're uncircumcised. You're no different than a Gentile. You're not committed to the covenant that God had made to Abraham. Thirdly, that you're also uncircumcised in your ears. You listen to anyone. You brought a bunch of false witnesses into this courtroom, and you listen to lies. And the fourth one is, you resisted the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit that filled Stephen, he's now made an accusation that you have rejected the Holy Spirit. The, fourth, the fifth one is that you've betrayed the Son of God. You've betrayed Messiah. You've betrayed the one promised through all of the prophets. You have betrayed the Son of God. And you've murdered. You've committed uh, the uh, sixth commandment. You've broken it. Thou shalt not kill. And you've also not kept the law. You've rebelled against the law. The Torah that you claim you have such reverence for that in fact you have rebelled against. Oh, these seven things they heard. And the reaction is they were cut to the heart. And when you think of that word cut, you're thinking perhaps oh, like a knife cut, but that's not what the word means. The word means to be sawn in two. It, you think of a saw. A saw is an action that keeps going back and forth, back and forth. And so he is given the message, the message of how the history of God in making a covenant with Abraham and then talking about Joseph and then talking about how he was rejected by his brothers and then Moses and how God had called Moses and used Moses. But Moses was rejected by his brothers back and forth. They're hearing again and again and again the message of God and it's cutting them 
deeper and deeper, and it's cutting sawn in half or in two their heart. Now, how do you saw a heart in two? That is because the heart is divided. The heart has on the one hand, they are listening to the word and saying it's true. There's not a thing that he has said that is false. They can't argue with it. Scripture supports what Stephen had said. But on the other hand, they, like Caiaphas, say, but it is expedient for us that one man should die for the nation, lest we lose our place and our position. They are saying, I don't want to give up on my position. I want to think what I want to think. I want to be the captain of my soul and the master of my fate. Oh, they're not willing to yield to the Spirit of God. They're cut and sawn in half, in sundered in the very heart, in their passions and their will. Are you, as you've heard the word of God and listened to the word of God, do you on the one hand say, oh, that sounds so true. But on the other hand, I don't want to give up my, my pet sins. I want to continue being me. Ah, oh, and being you, you failed to understand. You're made in the image of God. You're not made in your own image. You don't belong to yourself. You belong to Christ who bought you. And now we go and we find that they reacted. They first were cut in their heart internally, but then they gnash on him with their teeth. Does that mean that they all 72 got up out of their chairs, moved toward him, and started biting, gnawing on his fingers and toes? No, that's not what it's saying. The word epi is used on, and it means to be, it's a word, a preposition of direction. They're sitting there, and that word gnash, we get our English word bruxism from it. It's the gnashing or grinding of the teeth. They are, and you can see the visceral reaction even today. Somebody is angry, and they have a clenched jaw that they are grinding their teeth. And it is where they are grinding their teeth as they're looking at him. They're only seeing Stephen. They're not seeing anything beyond Stephen. They want to therefore dispose of him, and that's what they will do in a short time. However, what is Stephen doing, and where is Stephen looking? We find the next word in the Greek is being, and that word literally is what Stephen is. We have been watching what the Sanhedrin are doing. And sometimes when you're in a situation, we can look at people, but who are you? Are you a witness of Christ? And if you're a witness of Christ, that means you've been emptied of self and you've been filled with the Holy Spirit. That's what we find, him being full of the Holy Spirit. Remember earlier, we had seen that uh, Stephen was chosen as a deacon because he was full of the Holy Spirit. We then saw that he was full of wisdom. And then he began speaking. And this whole message that he has just delivered has been inspired by God. It was anointed because God is the one speaking through Stephen, just as God had spoken through prophets before. And him being filled with the Holy Spirit, he looks up steadfastly. Now the word for looks it's a really intensive word. It means to strain. He is now not looking at the Sanhedrin with clenched jaws and with fire in their eyes. Instead, he is looking intently, and he's looking, and he is looking beyond the ceiling. He is looking beyond when he is in the court of Solomon. He is looking and he is straining steadfastly into heaven. It's in the singular. He is looking and he sees into heaven. Where are you looking? If you be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. And you say, well, where is heaven? Heaven is the place where God is that you're looking not for the celestial heavens. You're not looking at the stars. No, you're looking well beyond the stars. You're looking into the very throne room of God as in the holy of holies to see where God is, looking at God. Well, that's what we find. He saw the glory of God. The word for saw there, 
It means that it visibly became uh, seen to him. He saw, and it wasn't with insight. It, it wasn't where there was something because of his studies of the word. No, it became visible to him because in that moment, God revealed himself to him. And I want you to notice something that's going on here. What he saw was the glory of God and Jesus. Notice in this verse, you have the Trinity, all three members of the Trinity that are mentioned. You have the Holy Spirit that he's filled with internally. You have him seeing the glory of God, God the Father. And you have Jesus who is standing. All three members are three in one. It is one person and yet three manifestations of that one person. And if you today know that Jesus is God who has come in the flesh to take your place, die on the cross for your sin, then you have experienced the glory of God. For that's what we find in John 1, 14, that he, we have witnessed his glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. But he is the expression of the fullness of the Godhead bodily. But we know that because of the Holy Spirit that dwells within us. It is now Stephen that sees the glory of God, sees that effulgent brightness, brilliance of God himself. There aren't words to be able to describe the glory of God, but that's what Isaiah saw. He heard the seraphim cry, holy, 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 the whole earth is full of his glory. And we have that also in Ezekiel, where he has that majestic revelation of the person of God. And in the last verse of chapter one, he says that is the glory of God. Have you beheld his glory? You do in the person of Christ. Otherwise, all you see are peoples and events and physical matter. That's all you see. And he saw Jesus standing on the right hand. The right hand is the position of honor. But this is so interesting. What we typically find is that Jesus is described as seated at the right hand of the Father. In other words, his job is finished. His work is done. He is seated. And it's also a position of authority. He is seated. Now we have him standing. What's going on here? Well, several things may be going on. But one thing is for certain. I know that I stand when someone comes into the room that I honor. You see, Jesus is standing, welcoming Stephen, soon to come home. Oh, what a dear expression we have in Scripture that expresses God himself who is standing and waiting for one of his servants to come home. Stephen witnesses Jesus at the right hand of God. And Stephen doesn't stop there. The very next word in the Greek, the first word in verse 56 is an. It's chi in the Greek. It's an, a simple symmetrical uh, a conjunction. It's linking it. Nothing is in any way different. And he goes from that and he says, and who is he saying it to? The Sanhedrin. In other words, his sermon that brought now such accusation, they now are being told this is in the imperative mood. It's a command. Behold, I see. And what does he see? Now that word is thereo. It is the large picture, and it is in the present tense. He sees. It is so incredible what he sees. He says, I see the heavens opened, and I see the Son of Man standing. Now when we find that word, Son of Man, that's also interesting. Because this is the only time we find in Scripture outside of Jesus speaking of the Son of Man where someone other than Jesus says it. It's a term that's describing Jesus. But what is it? Well, we find actually in the book of Daniel and in chapter 7, verse 13, 
Daniel says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, and like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him, and there was given to him dominion and glory and kingdom, and all of all people, nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. In other words, the Son of God became the Son of Man so that he might take back that which was relinquished to Satan by Adam. And now we have paradise that was lost, paradise that is regained. This phrase, the Son of Man, that Stephen is saying is the invitation of the gospel to these who are the Sanhedrin. Instead of thinking, why me? Focusing on him, having fear because of the reaction. He is now straining his attention toward heaven and he sees Christ who is standing and he is the son of man who is now, now going to take what is rightfully his and what he has given to man. Oh, my dear one, I pray you're as blessed as I am in this meditation. And may you, as you come to that day when perhaps you will die for your faith and you will be a martyr, you're not asking, will I have the grace or the ability to stand? No, your attention will not be on those who persecute you. It'll be on Christ who has redeemed you. Father, thank you so much. It is your word that is powerful. It's living. That's sharper than any two-edged sword. Might we, Father, be like Stephen and not the Sanhedrin. Might we, Father, have eyes to see and ears to hear and a heart that is broken for you. In the holy name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.